That is what I cried out when I saw for myself that Jesus had risen from the dead. This is how I would like you to remember me, for that strong statement of faith and conviction. Unfortunately, most of you will remember me not for my strength of conviction, but for my doubt. Even though several episodes in the Gospels mention my name, the one that is always remembered is the one I, time I failed to believe the other disciples when they told me they had seen Jesus alive after his crucifixion. I am Thomas, sometimes called Didymus, or the twin. You have nicknamed me, nicknamed me Doubting Thomas. Perhaps I should be upset by such a name, but maybe tonight you will find your life is not so different from mine. In fact, you may find that you have more in common with me than any other of the disciples. But I'm getting a little ahead of my story. Let me tell you a little of what led up to that day. Nothing in your Bible tells about my life or what I did before Jesus called me. Maybe that's good, because it really doesn't matter anyway. When I look back over my life, I really consider its beginning, the day Jesus called me to follow him. That was the day everything changed for me. I had always been a believer, a devout Jew. I believed that one day God would send the Messiah but like many, I was beginning to wonder, how long would it have to wait? I suppose the doubter in me sometimes wondered whether we would know it when God sent the Messiah. Oh, some thought the Messiah would come in a fiery chari chariot from on high, swords climbing, chariot wheels humming, horses stampeding, driving the Romans from our land and establishing the reign of David. It made for quite a mental picture. But as I read the scripture, it became clear that that was not the way God dealt with people. All of the prophets that God sent were looked down on, often unaccepted, often scorned, sometimes killed. The words were not the words of comfort. They did not say what everyone wanted them to say, and yet they spoke of the word of God. Maybe that's why I didn't expect the Messiah to come in any fiery chariot. Maybe that's why I was so convinced that Jesus of Nazareth was exactly who he said he was, the Son of God. Even though he didn't fit in the images so many had of the Messiah. All I know is that every word he spoke rang true. Every promise he made, he kept. Did you ever listen to someone speak, and after the person finished, all you could say was, yes, because it was so true, and you wondered, why, do you think, why didn't you think of it before? Well, that's the way it was with Jesus. Even though the things Jesus said were radically different from the prevailing thought patterns of people, every word held the truth. And if you were a student of the scripture, you knew that every word echoed what God had said all through history. Maybe it was the realist in me, and I guess that's really how I'd like to be remembered as a realist. Maybe it was the realist in me that never dreamed of riches or power, unlike James and John, who were constantly trying to vie for positions of authority with Jesus, thinking that they would be powerful figures of authority somewhere down the road. I was realistic enough to know things would turn out differently. I remembered how the prophets were treated. Not one of them became powerful or influential. Some were quick killed, Others ignored. Would it be any different for Jesus? I didn't know. Maybe that information helps you to understand my reaction when we were with Jesus and we got the news of Lazarus' illness. We all knew what good friends Jesus and Lazarus were. I guess I expected we would immediately go to Bethany to see what would, could be done. And so I was surprised when Jesus didn't do anything. Instead, Jesus stayed where we were for two more days and continued to teach. I assumed Lazarus must not be that terribly sick. Then, just when I thought we were going to stay put, Jesus told us to get ready to go to Bethany to see Lazarus. That's when everybody started getting nervous because we had heard a lot of people back in Judea were looking to kill Jesus. Several of the disciples tried to talk Jesus out of it, saying that Lazarus surely get better without his help. Then, 
when Jesus said Lazarus was sleeping, they all said that if he were sleeping, surely he was getting better, and it would be fine. Finally, Jesus came right off with Lazarus was dead. Well, as you can imagine, everyone was shocked. But now some were saying that we shouldn't go because we could do nothing more there anyway. That's when I spoke up. I had had enough of the bickering. Jesus' friend was dead, and he wanted to go with him. If that meant trouble, so be it. And so I fairly shouted to the rest of them to get their attention. Let us also go, that we may die with him. That was all that was needed to be said. From then on, no one said anything. We simply began walking toward Bethany. I didn't know what would happen when we got there. But whatever happened to Jesus, I was going to be there with him. You all know what happened when we got to Bethany. Lazarus had been dead four days, but when Jesus went to the tomb, he called for Lazarus to come out. Some of us thought he had lost his mind, but no one doubted for a moment when, when they saw Lazarus walk out of the tomb, still wrapped in grave cloth. I'll remember that moment for all eternity. It was then I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt, Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah. Another incident in the Gospel of John tells about me. You may remember the scene where Jesus is telling us about how he's going back to the Father. He said, In my Father's house are many rooms. I go now to prepare a place for you, and when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way where I am going, at that point, I was lost, and so blurted out, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know that way? Frankly, I didn't have the faintest idea what Jesus was talking about, and neither did anyone else. That's when Jesus said, I am the way, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. It was one of those times that would make, not make sense until much later. It was only after the resurrection that we were able to piece these things together. And then suddenly, it made all the sense in the world. But at the time, our minds were just too limited to understand. Now we come to the story you are probably most familiar with when it comes to me. People have often wondered why I wasn't there the first day when Jesus appeared to the other disciples who had met together behind locked doors. The reason isn't hard to understand at all. You see, I saw Jesus die. I don't know if you can understand what that means. I saw Jesus die. Maybe you have seen a friend or a member of your family die, but that is not what I'm talking about. Jesus was more than a friend, more than family. Jesus was life itself. My life meant nothing to me till I began to follow him. Jesus was hope and life. Jesus was the answer that the world had so longed for, and now he had been nailed to the cross. Do you understand? The Son of God nailed to a cross to die. That wasn't just Jesus hanging there. That was my life too. Do you understand? I died that day too. Every hope I ever had, every dream, all gone. I watched him die. I saw them carry his lifeless body to the grave. I guess the other disciples found comfort in being together. They were also afraid of the authorities, that they too might be arrested. I didn't care. I just wanted to be alone. I didn't want to be around anyone else. I guess we all deal with our grief differently. I didn't want to see anyone. Was I afraid of the authorities? I really didn't care. If they wanted to arrest me and nail me to the cross, I really didn't care. Everything inside me had already died. For them to kill this body, well, let them go ahead. For those first couple of days, I did nothing but walk. I couldn't even tell you where I went. Maybe I walked in circles, I don't know. Then I found a place to stay with a friend. I didn't talk to anyone. It was Sunday afternoon that my friend first told me of the rumors 
he had heard around town. He said some people were saying that they had seen Jesus alive. Wishful thinking, I thought. Your mind can see anything if it wants to badly enough. They must not have seen him die on the cross as I had. If they had seen that, it would be the only picture their minds would ever see again. It was Monday that one of my friends told me on the disciples were looking for me. Later that day, one of them called me and told me the most unbelievable thing I had ever imagined. He said that while they were together on Sunday night, Jesus had appeared to them and had shown them his hands and side and had spoken to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And then the disciples said that Jesus breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forget the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. You don't know how much I wanted to believe what he was saying, and yet I couldn't help thinking they must be hallucinating, seeing what they wanted to see. I told you, I'm a realist, and I won't believe something until I see it myself. For whatever reason, I left my friend's place and went with the disciples. They all told me the same story, and so I stayed with them. It was a week later when we were together, the door was locked. Suddenly Jesus was standing right in the midst of us. He said, Peace be with you. And then he looked right at me and said, Thomas, put your finger here and see my hand. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. It was true. Everything I had heard was true. Jesus was alive and standing right there. I slowly walked over to him, took his hands in mine, and saw the wounds of the nails. I moved his garments to see the large wound in his side from the spear where the soldier had pierced him. It was Jesus, I had no doubt. I was not hallucinating. It wasn't just wishful thinking, it was real. It was true. Suddenly, everything changed. I shouted out, my Lord and my God, then Jesus said to me, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. I knew it was a gentle rebuke, but he could have yelled and screamed at me. I wouldn't have cared. Only one thing mattered. Jesus, the Christ, was alive. And so it is tonight. Only one thing matters. Only one. Jesus Christ is alive my Lord and my God.
Let us pray. Holy God, you delight in creating life and beauty. Thank you for the abundant grace that you freely give. Let our church be a community that lives by this good grace and good news. Even our faith in Jesus Christ is a gift we receive. Use these offerings to further our church's mission, providing opportunities for people to grow in wisdom and to spread the harmony of your peace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Alive in the risen Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers before God who promises to hear us and answer in steadfast love. You shower your church with grace, O oh God. Unite the whole church on earth, so that with one heart it testifies to the resurrection of Jesus Christ with power and love. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You direct the nations, O oh God. Guide all in authority that they shepherd their peoples in the ways of your love. Defeat our impulses for war, for conflict, for abuse, for hardship against others, particularly those who are different from how we are. But so the peace of Christ upon those in authority and breathe upon them the Holy Spirit. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You place us in the heart of the church a spirit of sharing. Give us the power of your generous spirit that we provide for the needs of others. Announce your peace to those who are lonely, hurting, suffering, or afraid. Tonight we continue to pray for Ann Kelly, for Judy Swan. We pray for the family of Ted and Paula Lynn. Uh, both were fighting COVID. Uh, Ted passed away last week. We, we pray for their family as they go through this time of grief. We continue to, uh, continue to pray for Bob and Carmen Villa. And we pray for Carmen as she received uh, another injection in her back yesterday. We pray that this will finally give her the results and the relief that she's been looking for. We pray for Todd Miller, for Elaine Curry, Chris Hansen. We pray for Bruce Garrow, although we give thanks. He's been back in church the past couple of weeks, so we give you thanks that, that he is turning the corner towards recovery. We pray for Mike Edwards, and again, we give thanks in the fact that he is now back home. We continue to pray for Wendy Lustfield, John Lustfield, Carla Lustfield, Kelly Johnson, Holly Miller, Jane Hansen, Jody Reese, Corey Van Allen, Roseanne Sloan, Randy Schumacher, Helen Brink, Joyce Larson, Diane Peterson, Deb Christensen, and John Daniel. And once again, we give thanks. Uh, I received a phone call today, and John uh, plans to be in, at worship on Easter Sunday. So we pray. Uh, and give thanks that uh, his healing is continuing. And we pray for all of those that we name now in the silence of our hearts. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You give us fellowship with one another in our faith community here at Silverwood and at Trinity and at UMC. Shine the light of the risen Christ in our life together so that we live in love for one another and our joy may be complete. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. In the aftermath of the Colorado supermarket shooting, we continue to pray for healing in this world, uh, for, for those that have suffered a, a horrific violence and, and oppression. We pray that you, through the Holy Spirit, lead us to a time of peace, a time of, of accepting people for their differences, a time of unity among all people. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. In hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now, closing hymn is hymn number 338, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. <laughs> 